Now I'll invite Bishop Gates to preach to us. Good morning, friends. It really is a very great delight to be with you. The visitation scheduled on my calendar was St. Michael's in Holliston, uh, but thanks to your collaboration, I get the bonus of being with St. Andrew's folks as well. So um, what a gift. Thank you. It's a great to be with all of you. We could use some good news, couldn't we? We're in the throes of a pandemic. Our nation is bitterly divided. We are exhausted and anxious and sad. Wouldn't this be a great time for some reassuring words from scripture? It would. And thus, from the lectionary cycle for today, we are assigned a cheerful word from the prophet Zephaniah. This morning's first reading, you heard it from Sarah. The great day of the Lord is near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter, a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom. Welcome to Sunday worship, when we look for good news and seem to get more that's bad. Zephaniah applied his trade as a prophet probably in the 7th century BCE. It was a time when the kingdom of Judah was recovering from the long dark reign of one Manasseh, a ruler who never met a foreign deity he didn't want to embrace or a cruel perversion he did not want to try. But then after him came King Josiah, whose enlightened reforms turned the kingdom around. Zephaniah, the prophet, wasn't entirely sure that those good changes were going to stick. So he paints this picture of a really harsh judgment, which is bound to come if the people don't get with the Josiah program, if they do not follow the righteous reforms of the new king. So Zephaniah has warned that harsh judgment is coming for idolaters, for self-satisfied royalty, for covetous merchants. In this passage, he turns his attention to the indifferent, the complacent, Zephaniah describes the intensity and the certainty of judgment. Neither, says he, their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. Now, the thing about the prophets is that actually they're not foretelling the future as it must be. They are warning about the future as it will be or would be if the people don't live faithfully. It's meant to be motivational, you see. But it can't be motivational if there isn't an alternative ending possible. And that's the goal, the alternative ending. The good news, which is the opposite of the grim picture that the prophet has painted. The good news, which is the promise to those who avoid the pitfalls and temptations that lead us away from God and one another. So when is bad news good? When harsh predictions motivate us to make changes which then render the predictions inaccurate. Thus it is that through the ages, people in despair have actually found comfort in such predictions, in prophecies, or in what's called apocalyptic passages. Horrible things indeed will happen, but those horrible things will bring to an end other horrible things which are already happening. Right? My Lord, what a morning saying the American slave, yearning for an end to the inhumanity they were already suffering daily. My Lord, what a morning when the stars begin to fall, 
You'll hear the trumpet sound. You'll hear the sinner moan. You'll hear the Christians shout to wake the nations underground. Look in my God's right hand when the stars begin to fall. When God's people live in a world order, which they experience as unjust or fearful, and when they have lost their confidence in the ability of human agents to repair that broken order, then they look for God's dramatic intervention through prophetic warnings and dire predictions, for the old ways must be replaced with new ones. When is bad news good? When changes foretold are changes needed. Well, how then do we know when we are in hard times? Are they part of some divine historic realignment destined ultimately for good? Or are they simply the painful seasons which are a part of life in a world managed by leaders at best fallible and at worst sinful? Most often I expect we cannot know this without the long perspective of history. But St. Paul gives us some help. In today's letter to the Thessalonians, he writes, concerning the times and the seasons, affirming Jesus' own message that none of us knows the timetables of God, which, by the way, was the last verse before that gospel reading. None of us knows the timetables of God. So Paul suggests that we live at all times, at all times, in times of peace and in times of destruction, that we live as children of the day, this will be the Advent message, won't it, coming up, that we live at all times in a state of expectancy and waiting. So using battlefield imagery in today's passage, battlefield imagery that may have fallen out of favor in our day, Paul's passage is nonetheless quite inspiring to me when he says, since we belong to the day, put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. In our time of tribulation, how can you and I put on the breastplate of faith and love, or the helmet of hope? With apologies to those who heard my annual address at convention last Saturday, but recognizing that likely most of you did not, I want to share this conversation that I had recently with my 97-year-old mom. I was talking with my mother about the restrictions that we're all enduring during this pandemic, about our fatigue as the crisis stretches on. How, I wondered, did everyone manage throughout the four long years of World War II? My mom was 17 at the time of the Pearl Harbor attack. Well, she said, we just did what we had to do. And then she reminisced about food restrictions and ration coupons for things like sugar. And then she talked about travel restrictions and limited movement and how they didn't get to go to Maine to see family on account of gas rationing. But then mostly she talked about the six young men from her hometown in Bedford who died in the war. Two of them from her high school class, two from the class before, and two from the class after hers. After 75 years, she recalled each one of the six by name. And then she recollected what part of town each one had lived in. And then she rec recollected which one had been an orphan and which one had come from a family that had immigrated from Latvia and what work their parents did 
and whose surviving brother went on to become a Bedford cop for decades thereafter. It was a phenomenal demonstration of memory. But it demonstrated something else as well. It spoke about priorities in a time of crisis. When I asked her how people had endured four years of restriction and anxiety, her answer dwelled mostly upon those who had died, upon the deep loss to their families and community. So sugar and gas rations, lost opportunities endured by everyone else, these were recollected as inconveniences, to be sure, but they were not the tragedy. They were not the sacrifice. When you and I think about the COVID-19 pandemic, we must never lose sight of the fact that the restrictions and losses that most of us face, while real and resulting in frustration and grief, do not compare with the loss of life suffered by pandemic victims, 1.2 million of them so far, and their loved ones. To use St. Paul's vocabulary, the people my mom recollected had put on the breastplate of faith and love. They'd cared for one another. They made the relatively minimal sacrifices demanded of them without complaint, knowing that others were sacrificing much more. And they wore the helmet of hope. Now hope is a thing sometimes coming from sheer dint of personality. Some people are just irrepressible optimists. And other times hope comes from evidence positive signs that are buttressing our hope. But at the hardest moments, hope is the thing that we put on, like that helmet, an act of will, a matter of pure affirmation and conviction in the face of all odds. We live as a people of hope because we choose to affirm all that the resurrection declares. So in that gospel parable today, what if the one talent that the third servant was given is not financial resources at all, nor even his God-given gifts more broadly defined as we tend to do in stewardship sermons these days? What if the one talent provided to that servant was the gift of faith and hope? What if the thing that he buried rather than sharing it was love? For love is the one commodity which is actually multiplied rather than depleted when it's spent. So I think the mathematics of grace works in this parable if what he buried was love. To declare our faith and to proclaim hope when times are smooth and prosperous, no great challenge. In times of personal or communal trial, not so easy. To endure hardship, not just passively, but actively proclaiming the truth as we discern it, this is our calling. To assert our expectation of God's ultimate victory, which is the Easter message is our duty and is a thing expressed by love and therefore a thing not to be buried. And that is why masks are a sign of love and that is why closed concert halls and closed churches are a sign of love and that is why economic deprivation at every level is a sign of sacrificial love and why the notion of acceptable collateral loss of life in order to minimize economic hardship is anathema to us. 
When my mom's answer to how did you endure was to talk about baked bean and brown bread sales at the church and to name the boys who didn't come home, what she was talking about was community. Question, how did you endure? Answer, community. My intention is not to romanticize the small town 1930s experience of my mom's growing up in Bedford. I simply mean to say that in her context, the way four years of war was endured was community. And so I think it is for us. So dear friends, in the midst of a life and a world that feels a little too much like today's first lesson, go forth and be the church in community, as Zephaniah would have had, I think. Physically distanced, yes. Masked, yes. Gathering mostly virtually, yes. Sad and anxious and tired, yes. Worried and grieving and impatient, absolutely. But loved and capable. Blessed to be a blessing. Serving those who need you. Hopeful by disposition or hopeful as an act of will and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Be community in Holliston and in Wellesley. Be the church in Holliston and in Wellesley and in your own neighborhoods and workplaces and beyond. Don't bury your love, but be the body of Christ as I know you can be the body of Christ, as I know that you are. In Jesus' name.